Cool.fm is the perfect station for music lovers who enjoy a mix of adult pop, modern country, and classic hits. Our unique blend of different genres creates an awesome listening experience that you won't find anywhere else. With Cool.fm, you don't have to constantly change stations to hear the music you love. Just download the Live 365 app and start listening to our curated selection of modern adult and country hits, as well as the classics you know and love. So tune in to Cool.fm and start enjoying the best of all your favorite music in one place. Hi, I'm Eddie D'Angelini, the writer, artist, and creator of the comic strip Collectors, where you can find me at collectorscomic.com. And you are lucky because you are watching and listening to Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We're joined today by a returning guest. He's been on the show in the past and finally battling not only schedules, but convention schedules and everything like that. We are back joined with the creator of Collector's Comics, Eddie Giangelini. How are you doing today? Doing well. You got it right. Got it exactly right. Thank you. I'm doing fantastic. I'm really happy to be back. I really do enjoy your show and what you do. Appreciate it. And I enjoy what you're putting together as well, too, because you're the only business owner that owns a comic book shop that creates a comic about comics and that has such an extensive knowledge of the comic industry that, you know, I got to bug you more often for trivia nights. Sure. But you know what? I'm put to shame by some of my employees who are literally walking encyclopedias of the most minute comic knowledge sometimes. For those that don't know anything about yourself as a creative person, tell us who you are and what you're bringing today to Two Geeks Talking. My name is Eddie D'Angelini. I am the writer, artist, creator of a comic strip called Collectors, which is loosely based on my own life and my marriage and comic book collecting and where the two collide. Uh, my wife describes it as a comic strip about a comic book collector who loves his wife and his comic book collection, but not always in that order. And since we last spoke, you had a successful Kickstarter campaign previously. We were talking, I believe, about issue five or six. You'll have to correct me on that. You have a lot more coming up as well, too, since we last talked, which was almost like a year, year and a half ago as well. So so what's been happening with you more recently? Well, like you said, I did have a successful Kickstarter last year. I actually, if I remember correctly, I, I ran two last year, which is the first time I've done that. I usually do one a year, but last year, at the beginning of the year, I did a Kickstarter for issue number six of my comic strip. For those who don't know, it's published as a weekly webcomic. And then at the end of the year, I compile all those comic strips with new original material and put it in a printed volume. It's kind of like an oversized comic, usually about anywhere between 48 to 56 pages. And so that was issue number six, which collects a year. It was a little over a year's worth of comic strips and new material. And that Kickstarter ran the beginning of last year. And then towards the end of last year, I did a second Kickstarter for my first trade paperback, which is Complete Collectors Volume 1, which I have right here, handily nice. enough. There yep. is... The main cover, as you can see, it literally is a trade paperback. There is the main cover. And then I had a good friend of mine, Jamie Sullivan, who is a cover artist at IDW, who's done covers for G.I. Joe, Transformers, Star Trek. He did a variant cover for the trade paperback, which is this one right here. So the first one, obviously, is a Batman theme where it's an homage to the first appearance of Robin with me and my wife as Batman and Robin. And he kind of riffed on that and did an homage to, I believe it was Batman number nine from the golden age, wife and I as Batman and Robin. And I just, it makes me laugh every time I look at it because I'm little tiny Robin over here. Uh, I thank him for that. He's just a fantastic artist. The trade paperback actually collects the first three printed volumes of my comic strip that started printed, first printed volume came out in 2013. One, two, and three, I discovered by accident when someone placed an order for some of the earlier issues and I didn't have them, I discovered that they completely sold out. They're just gone. I think I might have one or two of them around the house that, you know, just to keep for myself, but they are gone. The, the inventory is out. So that's when I decided to reprint one, two, and three in a collected volume, which is Complete Collectors Volume 1. So eventually when four, five, and six sell out, that'll be Complete Collectors Volume 2. That hopefully will come someday. Are you thinking of doing a full omnibus anthology collector's edition sometime in the future future, like down the road once everything is maybe completed? Why not? <laughs> if enough people say they will buy it, I will make it. 
<laughs> well, that's the epitome of a true businessman right there. Certainly don't want to do it as vanity project. I'm 10 years into doing this comic strip. So I am considering it not just my creative outlet, but it is a business at this point. So I have to make decisions like a business person. Do I print this or do I not? Am I going to get return on my investment for it? If the answer is no, then it's not going to get printed. You know, someone suggested to me, oh, you should do collectors in kind of like the old 1970s treasury sized comic. And I thought, yeah, that would be really cool because I, I grew up reading those and I love them, but will people buy them? And my answer when I kind of did a little research was, no, they probably won't. Maybe a few small of my core fans would because they buy everything I do, but that's not enough to sustain doing a project, putting the money into it and actually making it a real thing. You end up with boxes and boxes of stuff that's not going to sell. And so as an independent comic creator, you have to take that into consideration. Is this something that is actually going to at least make me break even? If not, it's not worth putting your effort into that. You move on to the next project. Yeah, I have some comma cookbooks that are staring at me in the corner there. Like three boxes worth of 150 books a, a box there that I've been holding on to for the past 10 or so years. So I got to get selling those. A book that you did? Yeah, I put together with 60 other comic creators back in 2013, I think, where we raised money for the National Food Banks of Canada and, and America. It's called Web Comics What's Cooking. I'm intrigued. Now I want to buy a copy. So I'll have to follow up with you after this. <laughs> Sounds good. It's, it's funny because a lot of those comic creators have gone on to bigger and better things as well, too, in their career. So it's it's kind of like a time capsule of well, looking back on the past. That's your selling point. It's an early work of these now well creators. Yeah. There you go. Get to selling. But you're also not only a comic creator, you're a, a comic business owner as well, too. Since we last talked, how has the industry been on its current course? The pandemic, I think, or the end of the pandemic here, I don't think is affecting the comic industry too much anymore. I think right now what is, is a lot of people are hearing on the news talk about recession. Recession is coming. It's coming. It's coming, you know, inflation and this, inflation that. And whether or not there actually is a recession happening or whether or not it actually will happen this year, people hear enough about it that they are being more cautious with their money and they are less apt to spend as much as they used to. People are just being a little more reserved with it, being cautious. That is affecting the business because when people start thinking that way, the first thing that they cut out of their budget and stop spending on is entertainment. Movies, books, comics, stuff like that. That takes a hit. Like I said, whether a recession comes or not, we are already kind of planning for that slowdown to happen this year. And we're planning accordingly for it and not taking any huge steps that are going to be a big financial hit or anything like that. We're just kind of like buckling down and just figuring out what is the best way to get through this, this particular year. Because whatever's going on, I fear that it will go for pretty much the whole year. And it's good that you also are able to put out this trade paperback in terms of a, a Kickstarter campaign campaign as well too. You know, let's talk about that as well because campaigns like those are time consuming as well too. Between being a business owner, a comic creator, now you're running a Kickstarter campaign. It's good that you have a supportive system with your wife there as well too to help out. Yeah, because we run the shop together. So it's not the sole responsibility of either one of us. Otherwise that would pretty much just crush you. <laughs> there are times when I do a little more work. There's times when she does a lot more work. Right now she's really doing the bulk of it where I'm coming in and helping out where I can because of all these other things I got going. But yeah, running a Kickstarter for any indie creator, especially if it's just them doing everything like me, it's like another full-time job. You really have to hit it hard every day. You can't just launch your Kickstarter, put a post up on your social media or your website and say, hey, my Kickstarter is live and then just sit back and wait for the money to come in. You have to constantly bombard people with the message because you figure if you're bombarding it every day on social media, you're thinking to yourself, wow, I'm just telling everybody the same thing over and over and over. Well, not really because the way the algorithms work, only small percentage that particular time is seeing that message. So you've got to do it again the next day and then again the next day and then try to get that other small percentage that didn't see it. And then the next day, get another small percentage. Truth be told, I mean, the kind of principle of marketing is you've got to repeat your message seven seven times before someone actually takes action on it. You've got to constantly repeat the message over and over. And the one thing that I see 
indie creators do that is to their detriment is when they repeat that message and over and over, they are repeating the exact same message over and over and over. And you shouldn't do that. You need to plan this out well beforehand because you need to figure out each day, it's gotta be the same message, but in a different way. One day you're highlighting, hey, this book is this many pages and this book is gonna contain this and tell everyone about the book. The next day you gotta highlight, hey, these are the rewards that I'm focusing on. And this is some of the great stuff you can get. And then the next day focus on, hey, if you've got partners that are working on with it, hey, these are the people that are working on it and, and look at their great stuff. So every day you're giving them the message, but it's a different message every single day. That takes a lot of work because you got to sit and think, what message am I going to do today? And you got to plan it all well in advance. I'm getting that's tired awesome. of talking about it. That's why this show is here. So you can talk about it and you don't have to repeat your message six different times. <laughs> yeah. uh, but it also comes back to multiple social medias you have to promote on. You have to schedule your talks for these shows. You have to be engaging and entertaining on shows like this as well too to reach the different audiences we may be similar in the case of shows like this but everyone has their own style and everyone has their own ability and, and reach and everything like that so not only promotional but mentally you have to really think of different ways to answer the same questions as well yeah exactly because you can bore yourself if you just say the same thing over and over and people can sense that insincerity and boredom in your message comes across loud and clear just like Vin Diesel saying the same thing over and over again at least he's consistent when he talks about his movies but I mean I mean, that's that's an actor for you <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah i sympathize with actors like that that have to do promotional junkets because they are literally doing it all in one day practically and they're getting asked the same questions by different people over and over and over that's got to drive you nuts i can see why some of them snap sometimes in those things <laughs> <laughs> it's like how many times are you going to ask what is the movie about and what was your role type deal it's the same with you know as a comic creator with the collectors here it's like oh what is your favorite what is your favorite strip that you put together for your collector series between issues one and three i'm sure you have your favorite the ones that i tend to have as my favorites I have a certain formula because if anyone reads my comic strip, they know that obviously there's conflict between my wife and I, and the conflict is usually about me collecting comics and it taking over the house or spending too much money on a particular older book. And on her side, it's about her wanting to watch The Bachelor all the time or reality TV and taking over all the TV time. So there is conflict and they, you know, tend to have comic strips where we're kind of like aggravating each other and i've had people say that oh that can't be how your marriage really is or you two would be divorced it's exaggerated of course but i try to temper it with the three one ratio is how i put it for every three comic strips where we're kind of going at each other there's one where we're being like really sweet with each other so usually the ones where we're being really sweet with each other are almost always my favorites how about your wife? Does she like the cuddly ones, the cute cuddly ones, or does she like the argument ones sometimes? She likes the ones where she's getting one over on me. <laughs> but isn't so, that just marriage? Yeah, that's why she likes it. She says, oh, no, that's that's real. That's real. That actually happened. Oh, yeah, I like that one. <laughs> Marriage is about compromise and in, in life and comics, go figure. You've been doing this for a while now. You obviously have a lot to pull from, not only with the business, but with your life and everything like that here. Do you ever get tired of it? Oh, absolutely. And any creator who's been doing a particular book, comic strip or anything for as long as I've been doing it, I'm in my 11th year of doing it. Anyone who says no is lying, absolutely lying. At least once a year, I have kind of a writer's block where I think, Oh, that's it. I have no more good ideas. I've used up every good idea for a comic strip that I have. There's no more. The well is dry. And then a week or two later, I have more ideas and then I do more strips. And I think, oh yeah, that's a really good one. That happens all the time. When you know you have to do it, oh, I got to get it done before Wednesday and I've only got a day to finish it. It can be grueling. It's like a job where you have to just sit down and make yourself do it, even though you're not enjoying it. Once you're finished with it and you look at it and you post it and people comment on it, then you're enjoying it all over again. Yeah, it is a love-hate thing. I think that any creator will tell you that. The campaign itself will either be in pre-launch or will be currently ongoing, depending on whenever this gets physically released. You know, the fan reaction has been consistent. You've been promoting it for a number of years. You've been doing this long enough. You know your audience. Have fans come to you with their own story ideas, with maybe with their own relationships? Does that help you? That happens all the time. At a convention or if I see somebody that I know out, they will say, oh my God, I got a great idea for a comic strip. You got to listen to this one. I got a great idea. Spoiler, it's never a great idea. <laughs> There's there's a reason why, and I don't want to talk bad about anybody who's like enthusiastic about wanting to share their experiences or their ideas for a good comic strip. Writing comedy is hard. It's 
very hard. A joke has to have a certain tempo, a certain feel. It has to have a certain punch to it. For somebody who's never written comedy before, they might not understand that. So I get a lot of people tell me, oh, I got a great idea for a comic strip. And they will they will tell me a setup without a punchline. And they'll say, okay, you and Kristen are doing this, and then you do this, and then just write a joke at the end. Well, it, that's not how comedy works. That's not quite how it works. Yeah, it happens all the time. And I think people are great for being that enthusiastic that they want to share. And I love it, but I have not ever used an idea that anyone has ever given me. Oh, except one time, very, very early on. It was my wife that had a very solid strip idea. And I actually thought, oh, that's good. Cause she had a very, she had a complete idea, the setup, the conflict and the payoff, the punchline. And it was perfectly fully formed. And I thought that's a great idea. And so I did it and I credited her when it went out. So yeah, if you're going to come to me with your idea for a great script, all I say is have a strong punchline because that's always the thing that's missing. <laughs> It's like if you go to a comedy show and this famous comedian has a particular line that they always say in their show and they just don't give you that. Yeah. Or they tell you setup after setup and no joke. <laughs> you would think, wow, this comedian is not funny at all. But it's people like are great. I have never had a bad experience with fans, with people who read my comic strip, nothing. I have talked to other creators who have said that they've gotten a lot of hate mail or they get people writing trolls on their social media saying nasty things and they're not doing like very controversial or decisive work which is really odd they're just doing stuff similar to me and they get that and i'm thinking that's really odd because in the over 10 years i've been doing this i've never gotten that yeah. ever i don't know if i'm lucky or if i'm doing something wrong that i'm not getting that response from people you know i, I almost feel left out <laughs> Be careful what you wish for. It shows, I think, consistency to your message and your style of the comics you create those. If you're consistent, especially with the three to one ratio that you've been doing for 11 years now, and you haven't received any hate mail from it, you've found gold. So don't, don't look a gift horse. <laughs> okay. I'll go with that. Looking at some of the tiers though, that you're, you're currently entertaining though, for your, your campaign on Kickstarter here, what, what are some things that we can look forward to seeing not only from the trade paperbacks that you have, but what else do we have in store for us? Okay. Well, the next Kickstarter that is coming up is going to be for collectors. Number seven, the print volume collecting years worth of past years worth of strips plus new material, which I'm actually excited about because I usually in my books will write a four or five or six page original story about something that really happened to me in the next one that's coming up in number seven i did the same but i have a guest artist friend of mine that actually already did the art for it and it looks fantastic i did it twofold i thought well i want to try it because i want to see how well that would work having someone else step in and do the art but also I was thinking, ah, I'm kind of lazy. If I have someone I trust come in and do it, I can get the book done and finished faster. I always make it a point to have the book literally done before the Kickstarter launches so that when people go on and see my Kickstarter, I can proudly tell them the book is done. It's all done. It's all formatted. It's all created. It's all ready. Just waiting for the Kickstarter to fund. And then it's going to go straight to the printer. So there's no waiting. Generally, people usually get their Kickstarter rewards at the after the end of a Kickstarter within two to three months. I am just obsessive about getting it to people as quickly as possible. Because I hear so many horror stories about people who waited for years until they got something. Or some people who say they never got their rewards. I cannot rest until all of the rewards are out. I slaved day and night when the book is finished to get them all out. I'm just so obsessive about that. But the things they can look forward to are the same things that I've done in the past few that have always been popular. It is copies of the previous books, which in this case for this one will be the Complete Collectors Volume 1 and issues 4, 5, and 6. Sorry, one, two, and three are gone. There are no more. And original art. I still do the comic strips each week on 11 by 17 board, pencil, and ink. So I have originals that people can jump on that tier and get their favorite original. Another thing that I do now is sketch covers. This has been super, super popular the last two Kickstarters that I've done. I published number six, collector's number six, a small amount with a sketch cover on it. They'll get, along with all the, the regular books, Books, they'll get if they choose the Kickstarter tier of sketch cover, they will get a copy of issue number six with a sketch cover on it with the character of their choice. Any Marvel, DC, whatever character, they tell me 
I do that work on there. So that's been a super popular tier, unfortunately, because that slows down the process of me getting the books and all the rewards out quickly because I'm just slaving away doing cover after cover after cover. Also, uh, another popular one that I've done in the last couple ones is my custom enamel pins and magnets of my own art. I'm going to have more of those. I always have good stuff that people always just love. The core audience just loves to get the original art and the pins of my work. So I go with what's popular. I love it. That's awesome here. Before we do that, is there anything that you want me to ask you or anything that you want to share or showcase? I do. I actually would love for people to go to my website, which okay. is collectorscomic.com for two reasons. Uh, the first reason is you can go there and read all of the current comic strips, weekly web comics that I do of collectors. You can go there and read them for free. The second reason is I would love you to go there and join my collector's newsletter. Up on the top, there's going to be a little link that says newsletter. You can join my newsletter for two reasons. One, if you forget to go on social media on the release date of a new webcomic or go to my website, I actually send out the comic strip weekly to all the people on my newsletter email list. Don't have to worry about going back to the website each week or going on my social media. You get the new comic strip in your inbox free every week. And also in the newsletter, when anything's happening, like when the new Kickstarter for book seven launches, you'll get an email reminding you so you can jump on there and be one of the first to grab whatever reward you want to get the new book. So that's what I want people to do. Go to the website, collectorscomic.com. Well, Eddie, I do hate to say it, but that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. I want to thank you so much for coming back on the show again. I loved it. I would love to come back again. And I know you didn't want to give me hardball questions uh, or deep questions because we've done that before, but I yep. would love to come back another time and just pontificate about the comic business, about comic creating, about being an independent creator. And, you know, hey, giving people all kinds of advice on all of that stuff. Well, hey, I'll be happy to have you back on here. I'll, I'll dive into the 300 questions I have and find some that you haven't answered yet. And, well, we'll, we'll pick your brain on the business side of things as well as the creative side as well. Fantastic. I love talking comics. Before I let you go, where can we find you? How can we support you? Of course, where is the Kickstarter campaign and anything else you'd like to promote? Everything is always at my website. Go to collectorscomic.com. There's links to all my socials that I'm on. There's links to join the collector's newsletter, which will get you, like I said, the um, new comic strip every week for free and also notifications anytime a Kickstarter or any other news that I have uh, goes live. You'll get it in your email. So go to collectorscomic.com. Well, like I said, that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. You can, of course, find this interview and a thousand plus others on our website, tgtmedia.com or twogeekstalking.com. That's the word two, not the number two. Our YouTube channel is actually a lot more up to than our website because our website's going through a revamp, which is youtube.com slash tgtmedia. The podcast is back after 13 or so years. Two Geeks Talking or search for any of your audio streaming services like iTunes, iHeartRadio, Spotify, etc. And search for Two Geeks Talking and you'll find this interview and a ton more as well too. And as I say every week, everyone has a story to tell. It's up to me to help bring that out. Thanks for listening and watching on Two Geeks Talking.